Okay, our last presenter this morning is Mark Parsons, who used to work for the National Snow and Ice Data Center in Boulder, Colorado, and is now the Secretary General of the Precipitation Alliance. Mark, thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you for the invitation, everyone. Um, yeah, so I want to talk about how open data is not enough. We heard a lot about open data and it's necessary to generate open data, but I think also most of the presentations today highlighted how much work goes into making that data actually reusable and useful in a meaningful way. So the last one I thought was brilliant, some of those visualizations. Of course, there's a lot of work behind that that goes into making those visualizations possible. So here is an example of some data. Um, as Simon mentioned, I used to come with the National Sun and Ice Data Center. So this is actually a representation of data, and this is actually a relatively recent representation of these data. So it's, as you cannot see very well, but it's showing the Arctic ice extent. You know, as we just saw in the last visual, those visualizations, the Arctic is warming more rapid than anywhere else, and it's affecting the sea ice. So that dash line is this, was 2012, we saw this record low minimum. The um, solid line is the 30-year mean. The gray area is two standards of deviation. So you can see that 2012 was radically lower than, than the, the mean. And then the little blue line is uh, the current data at the time that I grabbed this image, which was back in May. So, but this data was, has been open since the 80s, but it was a long process to get to this pretty figure, which is a dynamic figure that you can play with on the web. It was designed for the press and for the general public. First of all, they, the satellite instruments that, were, that um, are used to divide this data were not even designed for CNN. They were designed by the Department of Defense for operational weather forecasting. And later on, they found out, oh, well, through some algorithms, we can actually detect sea ice. Well, and there were then competing algorithms. And so people would ask, well, which product is best? And the answer was, well, it depends. And so it became sort of a research question as to which algorithm to apply in which circumstance. It actually became sort of a political issue as to which algorithm was best, if you will. And it took a while for the data center to have this role of honest broker to say where to apply which. Um, furthermore, we heard from Julian the value of time series. So this is because there's a 30-year time series behind this, but that's a series of different instruments on different satellites. And it was a kind of significant research effort just to stitch those all together into a consistent time series. So with bridging across those different instruments was a challenge. Bridging across those algorithms was a challenge. We heard about grids, and projections, and format. All of that went into this. And then there's context. How are these data presented? The concept of the edge of the ice is defined very differently by a climatologist versus someone who's trying to operate a ship in the ice versus a local hunter who uses the ship as a I mean uses the ice as a platform to hunt seals or whales. So you had to present this in the context. So a lot of work goes into making what is seemingly a simple data set. And part of what I think we're trying to do actually is increase the generative value of data. This is a neat concept that I like. It comes from John Wilbanks, who builds on the concept from uh, Jonathan Zittrain, who is talking about the generative value of open networks. And Zittrain defines generative value as the capacity to produce unanticipated change through unfiltered contributions from broad and varied audiences. So in other words, we don't know what we're going to get when we make the data unavailable and, you, and useful in the opposite. So to increase that generative value, data needs to be more adaptable. You need to be able to reuse it in different circumstances. It needs to be more easily mastered. You need to be able to understand it and use it in your cool visualization tools, for example. Um, it needs to be accessible, of course. And it needs to be connected with other data or and influential in how it relates to that data. And as Wilbanks says, you know, we heard from, from Barbara Ryan about the monetary value of data, which is certainly important. But we shouldn't necessarily just be thinking about the net present value of data. We should be thinking about the potential value of data. And so Wilbanks lays this out as, as sort of a four-dimensional space. So we're trying to maximize these four dimensions, ease of mastery, accessibility, adaptability, and what he calls leverage, but you might think of that as interconnection, how well it's connected and related to other data. So we're trying to sort of fill that space as much as possible, but those things don't always work in conjunction with each other. That image that I just show you is very easily mastered, but it's not very adaptable. You can't use it for other things. So you need to make the data available in a variety of different ways to be both adaptable 
and easily mastered. Those sometimes are in tension with each other. So maximizing this space is not necessarily straightforward. So I just wanted to introduce that concept of generative value, because I think that's a large part of what we're trying to do um, by making data available. And so to make open data work, to make it really truly useful, first of all, we need curation. And we've heard a lot about curation here. And in my mind, what curation is doing is increasing that generative value of data, or it should be. We need to address context. Um, how is the what is the how is the data relevant in different contexts? How is what are the, what do the uncertainties mean in that particular context so that it can be reused appropriately? And of course, the theme of this meeting is trust, and that's central to all this. Trust in the data center to act as that honest broker um, negotiating between the algorithms. Trust in the science behind um, the algorithms themselves, etc. And a lot of this is what we're trying to do is create interactions, connections relationships or this metaphor bridges, which I will return to. But so bridges between different communities, bridges between different instruments, bridges between the data and the tools, etc. And of course, this requires people, it requires educated people and um, people that have the skills to make the data available and people that have the skills to use the data. So but the examples that we've seen today, and the one that I just gave um, in particular, was for one data set in one discipline um, in one domain, um, and we want to do this for all data, across all disciplines. And so enter the Research Data Alliance. So our vision, and I think it's shared by many in the room, is innovators and researchers openly sharing data across technologies, disciplines, cultures, scales, to address the grand challenges of society, such as climate change. And we do this with a very targeted mission of building these social and technical bridges that enable open sharing of data. That's an important metaphor, the social and technical bridges. And first of all, it's important because it evokes the concept of infrastructure. And that's what we're trying to ultimately create, is a data infrastructure. Which then begs the question, well, what is infrastructure? I think people have a lot of varying conceptions of what infrastructure is. At, at one level, we have something that looks like this. It's complex, and we want something that looks like this, something simple. Except that we're here in Europe, so we want something that looks like this. <laughs> um, so what we really need is things like this, these little adapters. And this is not just whimsical. This is actually the way infrastructure works. There is a field of study called infrastructure studies that looks at how infrastructure develops. And if you're to read one report on infrastructure studies, I highly recommend this one report from Edwards et al., written a few years ago. And they studied a variety of different infrastructures, from the railroads to the banking system to the internet. And what they find is that infrastructures are never constructed from the top down. There's never a central plan to which they build out. Instead, they go through an evolutionary process, this sort of staged evolutionary process, starting with the systems building phase, where specific technologies are developed to address a particular problem. And then followed by sort of a tech transfer networking phase where there's some transfer across domains. Maybe there's competing systems starting to develop. The classic example is the AC versus DC debate in the electrical system. And then finally, there's this consolidation phase where those different pieces come together into internetworks. And this consolidation phase is characterized by what Edwards et al. called gateways, but we might also think of as bridges, these interconnections. So it's really not so much a question of what is infrastructure, but when infrastructure. And I would argue that in the data world now, that's where we are now. We're in that final phase where we are trying to build those gateways, those bridges, those interconnections that build, bring the systems together. Of course, it's not just a question of when is infrastructure, but who is infrastructure and the people involved. Again, as Edwards et al. point out, that often we think of problems as either social problems or technical problems. So there's social solutions or technical solutions. But more typically, it's a technical solution coupled with a social choice. It's all well and good to have a standard, but you have to choose to use that standard. You have to choose to use it in a particular way. You, you can't specify exactly how work is to be done. You can't force a certain conformity. We have to allow that flexibility for people to choose to apply things in a certain way. So it, in my definition, infrastructure is a body of relationships, interactions, connections, between people, between technologies, between people and technologies, and institutions, and so forth. And so that's what RDA is trying to focus on, is building those interfaces and those connections. 
we have this sort of mantra of create, adopt, use. And so we have short-term working groups that only exist for 12 to 18 months, at the end of which they have actually implemented one of these little social and technical bridges, be it some sort of adopted policy. It's not just enough to have the policy, the implementation of the policy is what's critical. Systems interoperability, common terms, standard metadata, et cetera. Sustainable economics. I, we actually haven't talked that much about that today. And I think that's something really critical is how do we sustain trusted data services. And then I like this one of um, this, in this slide comes from Fran Berman, and I like her image of the rules of the road for adopted community practice. Um, and so I think that's something as well, is that we have to agree, you know, sometimes just passively as to how we work together. And then of course we have to train the next generation. So just to give some examples, um, again, borrowing from Fran Berman, Berman, she talks about the data engine. And so with the data engine, first of all, we need some of the technical aspects of the data engine. So we have a group that is working on a data type registry. So it's sort of like MIME types for data, if you will. MIME types are those things that when you, your email has a word attachment, it automatically knows it's a word attachment and opens up word. Wouldn't it be cool if that could happen with research data? That, you know, your tool automatically knew it was a hydrograph and the flow rates were in this column using these units and so forth. So this is a federated model of trying to describe data types. Um, something more domain specific, it's a group is focusing on taking a semantic approach looking to meet data interoperability. Not just data about the wheat itself, you know, um, harvest content, protein, I mean harvest levels, protein content, things like that, but also climatological variables around that. We need, as again, these rules of the road, these common agreements on how we do things. So for example, a common agreement on data citation, not just citing the whole collection, but very, a particular subset of a very dynamic changing data set. How do we do that? Common practice for data repositories. This is a harmonization approach where we're trying to bring the data seal of approval and the world data system together to converge on how they certify repositories. And then we need better drivers. We've heard about the summer schools program that we're doing it working in collaboration with coding to educate people on how to do data science. So these are some of the sort of things that we're working on. It seems to be generating some interest. We're growing, although primarily in um, North America and Europe. Um, we want to expand into the um, developing world, as we were discussing earlier. Um, we have a number of organizations involved, either as paying members or as affiliates. This is already out of date. There's several that are missing there. But to point out some of our colleagues here, ICSU, uh, World Data System, and CoData are, are close affiliates that we're working with. And so, so far, we've only been around for about two years, but I think we've actually had some initial impact. Um, at the first level, Data sharing, as we saw from Julia, is becoming a hot topic. Data is having its day. And I think the, the birth of the Research Data Alliance is partly a result of that, but I think it's also amplifying that. It's sort of a positive feedback in a positive way. If you will. Um, the value of collaboration itself, that's what I hear from the community most significantly, is the value that they get just by learning from other people in other disciplines, in other, in other professions, of how they can address it. Um, I'd like to tell some of the stories behind that, but I think I will pass on that in light of time and move on to some of the other things. So we actually have some real deliverables. Um, and these aren't just reports or white papers, they are actual little technical or social bridges that start to make data sharing work better. And for an international organization that's just over two years old, I think that's pretty good. International organizations are not known for their reputation. Um, and then also I think that we are saving money, and I have some genuine um, examples of that. One person gave me an example of just by building the community that she developed within RDA, she got three proposals. Now granted, one of them was a Horizon 2020 proposal that has the words Research Data Alliance in the solicitation, but two of them were not. And she feels very strongly that she would not have gotten those funded if she hadn't built the collaboration within RDA. Just another example, um, Jamie Shears from CERN was charged with this is a slide that he gave me. He was charged with coming up with a preservation strategy for 100 petabytes and growing of data from large hadron colliders. And he was overwhelmed. Um, but he went to RDA. He put this in terms of, you know, Beanie, 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 Candy, Saw, I conquered. He went to RDA, saw what others were doing, and he was able to implement and de develop, refine, and implement a strategy, including a business model, for 
preserving these data. And he, argued, he estimates this saved him about three years of time and about 20 FTP by, by leveraging what he learned from building um, relating to the community um, within RDF. So I think that's pretty significant. Not that those 20 FTE were laid off or anything, but that they're being reapplied. So in closing, I would just like to conclude. I would like to urge you to come to our next plenary. It's here in Paris. We have plenary meetings every six months. Um, these meetings are different from your typical research conference in that, sure, we have our you know, keynote speakers and so forth, but most of the time is the working groups, interest groups, actually getting together and trying to do their work. And if you really want to understand RDA, I think the best way to do it is to come to a plenary. And in light of this conference, this next plenary, I think, is particularly relevant because it has a focus on climate change. We, as in RDA, are discipline agnostic. We're trying to address all disciplines within the sciences, social sciences, and humanities. But given France's keen interest in climate change right now, we have this emphasis on climate change, and we have this data challenge that Bob mentioned. So I just encourage you to take a look at our homepage about that, and I'm going to close there. Thank you very much. I got a question. Mark, you know, Go ahead, Bob. So uh, is, the, is the worst case for uh, lack of interoperability sort of like the right side versus left side driver infrastructure where you really got locked in in different countries into incompatible systems. Is there a danger of that in the digital world? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's also something that's talked about in infrastructure studies is this danger of lock in. And so I think partly what the way we're trying to address that within RDA is being very bottoms up. And, and when people ask me why should I get involved with RDA, my typical response is what problem are you trying to solve? So we encourage anybody to get involved in trying to address the problem they're trying to solve. And we don't have, by not having that sort of top down architecture that might lock into a certain path, you might have competing systems. And that's fine. And let them sort of sort out in terms of which one is more broadly adopted, which one is more used. Not necessarily which one is the most technically robust, but which one is the most. Doesn't that still get you in the danger that um, you, know, you might have technology, you know, for Microsoft versus others or whatever, that when you're so locked in that um, you never get a good interoperability? So. Yeah, it's, there's always that risk, but I think, which by allowing this sort of organic approach, you can at least mitigate that risk. Whereas if you have a top down approach, I think you're amplifying. Any further questions from the floor? Like Windows versus Linux. And which, which system operates most of the servers in the world? Linux. This, this thing is, you know, Linux. 